Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. We enter the story of Israel today at its very moment of crisis. Turning to Exodus chapter 14 is like turning on the TV just as the chase scene begins or the battle cry is heard or the perfect storm is about to strike. The tension is palpable and the scene is vivid. From a distance you can hear the thundering sound of approaching hooves. Over the horizon you see the cloud of dust kicked up by 600 chariots and charging horses. A great army appears. It is an army driven by vengeance, determined to conquer and kill. And then you see the men, women, and children of Israel, their faces filled with fear as the Egyptian army bears down on them. They are trapped. The Israelites are trapped in the wilderness with mountains beside them, an army behind them, and the sea before them. Just hours earlier, they had escaped a life of slavery in Egypt. God had sent a series of plagues to torment the Egyptians and convince Pharaoh to let God's people go. The tenth and final plague finally broke Pharaoh's spirit when his oldest son died, along with the oldest son in every Egyptian household. The children of Israel, on the other hand, were protected. The angel of death passed over their homes because of the fresh blood painted on their door frames. They were saved by the blood of a lamb. And now Moses, God's chosen one, was leading God's people from slavery to freedom. Freedom and a new beginning in the promised land. But back in Egypt, Pharaoh's grief quickly turned to anger and revenge. He led his army's chariots in pursuit of the Israelites, intent on either slaughtering them or bringing them back to an even harsher life of slavery. The Israelites had barely tasted freedom, and now they look back, only to see the Egyptian army advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cry out to God, and they angrily rebuke their God-given leader. Moses, they say, Moses, weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you have led us into the wilderness to die? Why didn't you leave well enough alone? A life of slavery would have been far better than to die at the hands of the Egyptians in the wilderness. What were they going to do? What strategy could they devise? A diversion? There wasn't time. A counterattack? They weren't prepared. Should they run for the hills? They had no protection. Should they jump into the sea? They would drown. Fight or flight? What was the plan? Moses, what should we do? Do nothing, Moses said. Do nothing. They stared at him in disbelief, their bodies trembling and their hearts pounding. Be still, Moses said. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Moses lifted his eyes toward heaven and prayed. He cried out to God. And God acted. God delivered his people. God told Moses to raise his staff, and when he did, 
the waters parted. The Israelites walked through the sea. They passed through the waters on dry land. And when the soldiers followed them onto the path through the sea, God caused the waters to flow back, and the waves overtook them. Horses and riders and chariots were all thrown into the sea. And so the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and the Israelites raised their voices in a song of praise. This story, the story of deliverance at the Red Sea, is the story of the Old Testament. It marks the defining moment for the people of Israel. It was the moment of their birth as a nation. Just days earlier, they had left Egypt as fleeing slaves. But now, now they emerge from the sea as God's people. This event is referred to countless times throughout the rest of the Old Testament. God reminds his people again and again, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God who set you free from slavery. I am the Lord your God who delivered you. The story of the Exodus reveals God's power and mercy and it serves as one of the most significant symbols of the biblical faith. Throughout the events of the Exodus, God reveals his power and might, his mercy and grace. God saved his children from death by the blood of a lamb. He freed them from their bondage. He delivered them from the hands of their enemies. He led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the sea, out of slavery, into the freedom of the promised land. But for all its significance, the story of the Exodus is but a hint of what would come. It pales in comparison to God's act of deliverance in the New Testament. The story of the Old Testament points to the story of the New Testament, which is the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the parallels between these stories, the parallels are striking. At the Last Supper, Jesus and his disciples are sharing the Passover meal in commemoration of God's mighty act of deliverance so many hundreds of years earlier. The disciples don't know it yet. They do not yet understand how the ancient story of their deliverance was about to be enacted, fulfilled, and surpassed by Jesus and that the events that were about to unfold would be the story of salvation for all the world. At that Passover meal, Jesus broke the unleavened bread and said, This is my body. He poured the wine and said, This is my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And the very next day, Jesus bled and died on the cross for you, for me, for all people everywhere. God sent us a deliverer. We who are in bondage to sin and death have been set free. Jesus said to the devil, let my people go. And then Jesus took our sins and the sins of the whole world with him to the cross. Jesus, the Lamb of God, poured out his life and his blood so that we would be saved. And then three days later, Jesus parted the waters of death 
to open the kingdom of heaven, the promised land. He sent those same waters crashing down onto the devil, crushing his head and destroying the powers of sin and evil and death. This story, the story of deliverance, is our story in baptism. In the water and the word, we are joined to Christ's death and resurrection. We are saved by the blood of the Lamb. The angel of death passes over us because of the blood of Jesus. We are covered with the righteousness of Christ, and God's promise is sealed. I am the Lord your God, he says, and you are my people. So what do we do to achieve so great a salvation? I hope you know the answer to that one. What do we do? Nothing, yes. What did the Israelites do at the shores of the Red Sea? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Stand still, Moses said. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Oh, yes, my friends, there is great theological truth here. We do nothing to earn or deserve our deliverance from sin, death, and the devil. We die with Christ in baptism. We passively receive the gift of faith. After all, when you're dead in Christ, uh, you're passive, right? <laughs> it's all done for us. We are called, gathered, enlightened, justified, and sanctified. And you see, these are all in the passive voice because God is the actor in all of these things. God is the actor, just as he acted to save the Israelites. Like the Israelites, we may at times feel like all hope is lost. Caught between a rock and a hard place, we may be overcome with heartache, grief, or pain. We might think that our sin is so great and our guilt is so deep that it is beyond the reach of God's grace. Betrayed, confused, and alone we might be at the very brink of despair. But listen. Listen. God says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. God's word is spoken. The promise is sealed. Our deliverer has come. His name is Jesus. Amen.